Sorry, you guys are usually ready right away, but wow, good job. You guys ready for Revelation? All right. Well, if you want to turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 15, uh, we're working our way through the book of Revelation, and um, it's, it's definitely an encouragement as I'm going through it. I'm, I'm loving it. So I've been studying alongside uh, Pastor Rich and Pastor Joe, and it's been, it's been exciting to how the Lord speaks to, speaks to me and sp- spoke to them, and it's the same text, and yet it was different, you know, but it, yet yeah, it's the same thing. It's just amazing how God can do that. Um, let's, let's pray one more time, guys. Lord, thank you so much again uh, for this time that you've given us, Lord, that we can read your word, we can consider it, Lord, and apply it to our hearts. We, we do ask, Lord, that you would teach us, train us, equip us. Uh, for the work of the ministry, Lord, that we might be your servants coming alongside and under, uh, if you will, um, others and, and, and blessing really them. <laughs> so help us, Lord, um, in, in the days that we live in uh, to serve you faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right, Revelation 15. Um, again, thank you guys, by the way, for, uh, for praying uh, for me specifically as well. Um, I noticed, on, so the last services, I've, I've been meaning to come to church, and I've been having this, uh, you know, oil, basically, to come and have the elders pray over me, right, and anoint, and, uh, and each time that I was ready to come to church, that is the time that there was excruciating pain, and I was just, I didn't want to come in tears, you know, and, and, and just crazy pain, and uh, so I finally, I, I realized, wait a minute, that crazy pain's only hitting be- Wednesdays and Sundays before church, and it, it'll just throw me off, but it was the highest, and then I realized it's spiritual warfare, and, and so of course this last Sunday, what do you know, it flared up again, and I was like, of course it would, and, um, but I made sure I came, and, and, and uh, the elders, they prayed for me and put the oil on, and since Sunday, uh, you know, coincidence i don't know about that uh but it, it's been you know i would say high intense pain and and since sunday it finally dropping i'm starting to see that that difference now where uh like right now i have it down and and normally it would just be throbbing like crazy and and uh so thank you guys for praying and it, it's just amazing right when you're you're faithful to the lord to do what he said to do, right? Go to the elders, and they can anoint the oil and, and, uh, and pray for you, and, and there would be healing. So I'm thanking the Lord for that. It's so good. Uh, and I thank, thank Pastor Rich, Pastor Joe, for, for teaching. Um, they are, aren't they so good? <laughs> I was like, man, how cool the Lord can use their gift. It's a gift that God's given them, um, and how they... they, they uh, can teach. But anyways, let's get started here. Revelation chapter 15. Uh, before we just jump and dive into it, I want to give you guys a little bit of a, a reminder of, of, by way of background uh, to how we're looking at the book of Revelation. Uh, if you guys remember, we've divided Revelation in three parts according to Revelation chapter 1 verse 19. Um, it, it says, John is told to write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. And, and so we, we see the past tense, if you will, in chapter 1. Uh, you know, John's on the island of Patmos. He gets taken up. He sees the vision of Jesus. Um, and, and now we also see the present tense, if you will, where uh, you got the, the church, right, in chapter 2, chapter 3. Uh, where uh, John is being told to write down these seven letters and, and give them to the seven churches, right? To the seven angels, to the seven churches and, of Asia Minor. And so these letters that he gave to them really dealt with, um, well, they were basically letters of commendation, and also they were letters of condemnation at the same time and and so there was application in each one of those letters as we went through uh, for all of us right that we can apply in our lives as a church today and now the third and final section of the whole book um, the way we divided it is we're going to be looking at 
um, John was told to write the things which will take place after this, right? And so in chapter 4 all the way to chapter, uh, well, 22, uh, John really writes three things. Uh, he writes about the rapture of the church in chapter 4 and 5. Uh, in fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 uh, through 16 to 17, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, who are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And so this snatching up, this being caught up, this harpazo, if you will, that's basically what it means. We're going to be uh, caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. In fact, in verse... Um, what is that, 18, First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, comfort one another with these words, it says. So, um, in fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which we're going through in, on Sunday, uh, verse 51, it says, Behold, Paul says, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Now, here at Olive Branch Fellowship, uh, we believe that the Lord can come back at any moment. Uh, in fact, right now, the Lord can come back. And after that, uh, there will be the, the wrath of God coming on this earth. We don't know exactly when uh, that moment's going to happen. Um, it seems in Scripture like it happens right away, uh, but we really don't give, we don't have like a set time, right? So could it be uh, a day later? <laughs> could it be a month later? Could it be a year later? Could it be 10 years later? Uh, the Bible's not specific exactly to uh, when that is. So uh, in fact, we do know that God is going to have his wrath being poured out in this God-rejecting world. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, even Jesus who delivers us from the, what? The wrath to come. Who is he delivering? The church, the body of Christ, right? And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it says, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation, we're being saved from, right? We're, we're saved. God is saving us from this wrath to come. In fact, in Romans 5, 9, it says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved through, uh, from wrath through him. Uh, in Revelation 3.10, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Uh, in fact, Jesus tells us, uh, to pray regarding this in Luke chapter 21, verse 36. He says, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So uh, the first... things. We got the wrath of God. And, and, and the wrath is really, we see that in chapter 6. We see it all the way through 18. And, and this is what we call the seven years of tribulation. A lot of people refer to the last three and a half years as the, um, the great tribulation, right? Because that's really when you see
where it's blasphemy against God, right? And, and so there's going to be a mark, there's going to be a number, we know it as 666, uh, and those who have understanding, wisdom, they'll understand that at that time. Uh, but you can't buy or sell without this mark. Now, obviously, if you're keeping a, a, a watchful eye, um, we know that this is being implemented even now, right? 20 years ago, we were like, what is that mark that the Bible's talking about? <laughs> uh, 50 years ago, I have no clue what that's talking about. Um, we can only speculate, but now it's like a duh. If you go to the airport and you're, you, you go to certain stores, um, you can walk in if you have this mark, grab whatever you want, and just walk out, and it immediately it charges your account. If you don't have that mark, whatever you know, system that is, whether it be Amazon or uh, whatever it is, um, you got to just put your credit card right at the at the beginning, and then it takes you your credit card, and then you just grab whatever you want and walk out, and immediately it, you get charged whatever that is on your credit card. So uh, this is the world that we're in, guys. This, the system is already at play. We already have, uh, you know, this mark. By the way. When it gets implemented, just like the, the things that we're seeing right now, it's going to have your, it's gonna basically your passport, your driver's license, right? It's, it's your, basically your identity. You don't need your, all your registration paid. Where did I do with it? Where's my insurance, right? It's all there on the mark. The, the cop gets to scan it, and there's all your information. You got your medical information. Um, everything about you is in one place. And who's running this system? It's an AI-generated system, right? Uh, it, it's the and, and someone's going to be in charge of all of that. And so this Antichrist is going to come on the scene, and we'll see that a little later as well. Um, he's going to run that system. That's going to be that political system, and, and we'll, we'll look more on that a later, little later. But at the end of those seven years of, of God's wrath, um, God will uh, basically conclude his wrath after these seven bulls that we're going to talk about and, and just like he did when he flooded the earth, there came a certain point where he concluded his wrath on earth. It was satisfied, if you will. And so we're going to start to see that uh, coming up. But which brings us to the third and final thing uh, that John writes about in Revelation. It, he writes about the return of Jesus Christ to this world um, as, well, Jesus is God, right? In, in chapter 19 to 22, uh, it's talking about, well, in chapter 19, when God comes back, this is second coming uh, to this earth. Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, it says, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. It's also mentioned in Matthew chapter 25, verse 32, where it says, All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats and so we're going to go um we're going to see more of that later that's basically the battle of armageddon uh we already seen the preparation if you will of, of this battle in chapter 14 uh but we're going to take we're going to talk more about it in chapter 16 as we get through there so jesus uh during that time though in chapter 19 20 21 22 he's going to establish his thousand year rule and reign here on earth and then after the fact, we're going to see a new heaven, a new earth. It's just going to, we're going to be spending eternity with the Lord, right? It's going to be an amazing time. Uh, and so that's just in a nutshell how we divided the book of Revelation and, and, and coming back to our, our study here. So now before we, we get started, um, let's catch up a little bit on what's been going on. Uh, the seventh trumpet was blown, and it causes a lot of things that are happening uh, in heaven. In fact, we see the middle of the tribulation here on earth from the, the seventh uh, trumpet being blown. We also see the end of the last three and a half years of the wrath of God being poured during that time. We see the church in heaven is rejoicing and they're, they're praising the Lord at this point. It also points to the second coming of Christ. It also announces uh, various uh, signs and visions and in chapter 12, we looked at two of those signs. We, number one, we looked at the sign of the woman, uh, which was Israel. And we also looked at the sign of the dragon, which was Satan. And, and so in chapter 13, we looked at two visions. Uh, we, we looked at the vision of the beast that came up out of the earth. 
that's we saw was the antichrist and you know he's going to rule and reign over this global uh political system if you will governmental political system and in this one world order he's going to come out of that 10 nation confederacy he's going to be that uh become the eighth and final um world empire and the second vision that we saw i know i'm flying through this guys uh, but the second vision that we saw was the beast that came up out of the sea, and that is the false prophet. Uh, the false prophet is, is uh, uh, ruling and reigning, if you will, over the religious one world order uh, of this world. And so uh, we got the political and we got the, the, um, the religious, right? And, and so the, the false prophet is with the religious, and we're going to talk more about him uh, in chapter 16 and 17 in their next uh, couple studies, um, Lord willing, we're not here. But if we are, we're going we're gonna to be faithful to the word and we'll, we'll be there. But in chapter 14, we looked at three more visions in chapter uh, 14. We saw the vision of his redeemed servants, right? The 144,000, the 12,000 of each tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, and we looked at his everlasting gospel, right? The angel was proclaiming the gospel worldwide into every language, every culture, right? The, the, everybody was hearing the gospel. And we looked at his final harvest uh, in the vision of Jesus. You guys remember um, in his hand, he was reaping, uh, he, had a, uh, he had a sickle, right? And he's reaping a harvest. And, and speaking of that final battle, uh, of Armageddon and and the wine press, if you will, of his uh, the wrath of God uh, on this God rejecting world, but it's finally complete. His wrath is complete at that point, and so this brings us to chapter fifteen. Um, we're we're going to look at three final visions here uh, in chapter fifteen. Um, the first vision is a sign of the last plagues. The sign of the last plagues. In fact, look at verse 1. It says, then I saw. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to divide this chapter into three sections. The first is going to be uh, by what he saw here. The second vision is the, of the sea of glass. And that's going to be in verses 2 to 4. And notice in verse 2 it says, and I saw. Uh, the third vision is of the temple of heaven, and we're going to see that in verses 5 through 8. Notice in verse 5 it says, and I, I looked, right? So I saw, I, I saw, I looked, right? And so I see that. Uh, that's how we're going to divide this chapter. So let, let's just read it, and then we'll go in and get started on it. It says in chapter 15, verse 1, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, Seven angels having the seven last plagues, in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways. O King of the saints, who shall not fear you? O Lord, gl and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. And after these things, I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open, and out of the temple came seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Woo! You guys ready for this? <laughs> oh, man. 
Uh, let's look first of all at these uh, the seven last plagues here in verse 1. Notice in verse 1 he says, Then I saw another sign in heaven. Um, this sign, by the way, of the seven last plagues are the seven bowls of wrath that is mentioned in chapter 16. Now, uh, but notice this first vision is a sign, right? This, this is the first vision, which is actually the, um, it's actually the third sign. Uh, this is the last sign that we're, that we're given, but uh, of the last plague. There's two things about this sign, if you guys are taking notes. Number one, Notice it's another sign, another sign. Uh, it says right here in verse, then I saw another sign. By, by the way, this word another, this is another of the same kind of signs. So this is another of the same kind of signs that we already saw previously. And so chapter 12, what, what, what signs have we seen previously? Chapter 12, we saw the sign of... Um, uh, the woman, right, which was Israel. We saw the sign of the dragon, which was Satan. And so this is a sign like those signs, right? It's a, the same, uh, it's another of the same kind. So all three of these have something in common, these signs uh, to where, uh, that are given to us. They're, they're all located in the heavenly realm, uh, which is interesting. Now, the second thing about this sign is, it's an important sign. It's an important sign. Uh, notice the two adjectives that are used here to describe it. It says, then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues, and for in them the wrath of God is complete, but great and marvelous. Did you guys catch that? Great and marvelous shows the importance of, of this uh, particular sign. Uh, in fact, the word great, mega, um, it, it's like saying a, a, it's a mega deal, right? Um, marvelous uh, is basically something astounding, something uh, amazing, right, is the word uh, marvelous. And, and question, what is so amazing, what is so astounding about this? Uh, well, it's found at the end of verse 1. Notice at the end of verse 1 it says, for in them... The wrath of God is complete. So in other words, it's like the grand finale. This is when the wrath of God is, comes to a, a completion, right? It's done. Uh, in, in fact, that word complete is an interesting word, teleo. Um, Jesus used the same word, the same, uh, 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 what do you call it? The, um, the root word is, is uh, it's similar here, the same word. It, in fact, it, when he was there at the cross, what did he say? To Talistai. W that means it's finished, right? Uh, it's the same thing. So uh, interesting. So what, what was finished? God's redemptive plan for mankind was finished through the shed blood of Jesus Christ there upon the cross of calvary for you and i right so we already seen god's judgment being poured out uh with the the seal judgments right each seal was broken and we, we read further then it was broken and we kept going uh seven seals were open uh the the seven trumpets we already saw now we're going to see the seven bowl judgments coming up in chapter 16 uh and on uh, where God's wrath is finally going to be finished. It's, it's final. And so we're going to see God judge the political uh, and the, the, the religious system there in chapter 16 and, and actually 18 as well, um, where it's all going to be done. Then in chapter um, 19, we're going to see the second coming of Christ, and, and it just keeps going from there. It's amazing. Uh, but let's, let's keep going here in our, our study. The second vision is of the sea of glass. The second vision is of the sea of glass in verses 2 and 4. Um, it says in verse 2, And I saw something like a sea of glass. Now, there's three things that I learn uh, about this sea of glass. It, number one, it's mingled with fire. It's mingled with fire in verse 2. It says, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. Now, in chapter 4, 
uh, if you guys remember, this is something we already heard of, right? The Sea of Glass uh, was actually, um, uh, it, it, was, it was mentioned before, which is the church, uh, you know, uh, that's in heaven. John is, you guys remember, he's looking at the things that are, that are happening um, uh, and going to happen, you know, in the future. Speaking of the events that are going to happen after the rapture of the church. In fact, in Revelation uh, 4, 6, it says the sea, it was a sea of glass um, as of crystal, right? Um, and so here, it's actually mingled with fire. And so it's interesting. Now, there's two views, by the way, uh, major views to, as, as to what is this sea of glass and what is John talking about right here, right? What, I mean, what are you talking about? View number one, uh, they say that this sea of glass mingled with fire, the fire represents God's judgment. Uh, and so since fire speaks of judgment and God is going to judge with fire, when you look at these seven bowls of wrath, I mean, you could think of fire, right, coming down, and we'll get to the specifics of those, uh, but we do see fire. We see, you know, it's, this is, I mean, things get really heated up. In fact, on earth, those last three and a half years, the first three and a half just seemed like boom, you know, and time went on, and boom, and time went on, and boom, and, but now, the last three and a half years are rapid fire, like, do, 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 do. I mean, these, these seven bowls are really happening on earth pretty quick, and so, that's view number one, um, as far as these, you know, uh, God's judgment, as far as, you know, what is this fire mingled, the, the sea of glass mingled with fire. The second view uh, is another popular view where they say it's not fire, it's not speaking of God's judgment, it's actually speaking of physically or, you know, visually uh, looking out, John's looking out and he sees the the tribulation martyred saints all around. Uh, and, and so the sea of glass is basically these martyrs, right? The, the, the wrath of Satan, if you will, on earth during this tribulation, tribulation time. Um, and, and uh, uh, you know, the wrath uh, that we saw here on earth, these believers, these new believers, they gave their life onto the Lord. They surrendered their hearts to the Lord. And what happened? They got beheaded because of it. And so that, that's a popular view that the sea of glass mingled with fire uh, is actually speaking of these martyrs that got fired, if you will. <laughs> All right. um, and in fact, in 2 Corinthians 5.8, um, Paul says, We're confident, yes, well, please, rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. So these martyrs, uh, are in heaven since they went through these fiery trials, if you will, that's their view, um, that, uh, of the Antichrist that he brought on them. Remember, he mandates everybody to be uh, worshiping the image of the beast, right, and take this mark. These believers chose not to take that mark, chose not to bow down to the system, and thus they died for their faith in Christ. And so here they are before the Lord. So that's view number one and view number two. I like view number one more so, uh, but view number two, I kind of lean a little more on because of our next section here. So let's come to the second thing I learned about the sea of glass is, it, well, it's filled with believers. <laughs> uh, look, look at the end of verse two. It says, and those who have the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass having harps of god which i love by the way i was looking up harps and i was like whoa those things are expensive <laughs> but those are so cool Does any of you guys know how to play a harp by the way in here no okay we need, we, we should get a harp and have somebody play on worship we, we gotta talk about that that'd be cool um anyways um so these believers who died during uh, that tribulation time, uh, they stand before God, and, but, but they're standing before God victorious. And it's amazing. So they chose Jesus over the worship the, of this you know, beast system. And so they get beheaded. And the world might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. They died. In other words, they failed, right? Um, at, because they died. But for us as believers, guys, death is not our end. 
Our end is victory. We have, we're victorious in Christ Jesus. And by the way, uh, Paul said in Philippians 1.23, for, you know, he was hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, right? It's amazing. And the only reason he's here uh, is, is really he wants to glorify God while he's here, right? We're on borrowed time, and, and we have the breath of God in us, and we want to spend that time uh, to serve the Lord during that time. In, in 2 Corinthians 5.8, Paul said, We're confident, yes, well, pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So when we leave this body, whether you be uh, our body goes to the grave or to the furnace, our soul goes to heaven. And so the best thing that can happen to us as believers is we're going to be in the presence of our king, right? It's going to be an amazing time. So um, uh, currently, keep in mind, we're, we're in this world right now, we're in a battle between our flesh and the spirit. But one day, we're going to be in, well, I guess you can say 100% in the Spirit, right? In our glorified body. And it's going to be an amazing time. So understand, church, we will not be victorious then. We are victorious now, right? Um, and, and because of Christ Jesus in our hearts, if you are... Uh, if you've given your heart onto the Lord, if you're, you're living for the Lord, you recognize you humbled yourself upon the cross, you have that fear of God uh, within your heart, right? And God has done a work in your heart. There, you, you see a transformation of God in your life because of that, right? That's real. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. So uh, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty seven says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And in Romans 8, 37, it says, Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, I understand that we go through difficulties in this life, right? I get it. We're, we all go through those ups and downs, if you will. We, we have, uh, well, physical issues. <laughs> we have maybe financial issues. Maybe we have family. Maybe you are, you're blessed and you have all three of those issues, right? Um, either or, um, we, Ephesians 1.11, I love this. Paul said, in him, in Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, all things, by the way, according to the counsel of his will. And so for us, guys, this is a blessing. For us, what you go through in this life is not category good and category bad. What we go through is category God, because well, what we just read, right, uh, in, in Ephesians 1.11, God, Jesus, is working all things according to the counsel of his will. Every, he's working it all for good. All the gifts, all that God gives us is good, right? And it's for his purpose. It's for his glory. And so everything that you're going through, just see Jesus in all of it, right? Because he's the one putting the puzzle pieces together. You see, you and I see right now, we, we just see, you know, dimly all the things that are yet to happen and yet to come. But we're seeing things on our timeline as they come, and we don't see the big picture, right? We're like, Lord, how am I, wh what are you doing, <laughs> right? He knows what he's doing. He's a mysterious God, by the way, isn't he? He, d he works things just mysterious. He, he uses the people you never would have chosen yourself. Well, you and I would choose, well, do you got a degree? Well, you should do this then. And God says, oh, I see little David over there playing with the sheep. I'm going to choose him to be king over Israel, right? Uh, I'm going to use Gideon over here, right? I'm going to use, right, the, the people that, I mean, God is just amazing. And, and then even if you're a warrior, if you will, uh, God even tells you, hey, march around that city, through, you know, and in fact, blow trumpets and and watch and see, right, what's going to happen. Isn't this so cool? As I read through scripture, I once I think I figure out God, it's like, yeah, no, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> I thought I, I did, but no. Um, that's why we walk by faith, right? Not by sight. When we walk by sight, that's when you get in trouble. So we're to trust in his word, walking by faith, and, and just trusting in him. So um, I, I love how he's at work, right? And that victory 
is only because of Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? It's Christ in us, and because of him, you and I are victorious in him. So, um, by the way, I think it's interesting before we keep flying through here. I'm sorry, I'm excited, guys. I kind of go too fast. I have to put little things right here to pause, and I still don't listen to myself. Um, back in the day, uh, you know, the kings would have this polished granite before their throne. This, this, the, some would refer to as a sea of glass, if you will. And if you enter in and you step one foot, before the throne room of God. Isn't that cool? Uh, we can come before the throne of God and enter in. You and I have access. You and I have that VIP card, if you will, uh, to come before the Lord at any time. Isn't that neat? I love it. it it's just amazing. So um, it's just so cool. And it's because of what Jesus did for you and I that we even have that access, that entrance, if you will. And but by the way, keep in mind, you can't enter into the presence of God because you're holy, because you're worthy. Eh, I don't think so. It's because he is worthy and because he is holy and he has set you apart because you have chosen him, right? Because at the cross, you lay down your life. You died to yourself. You picked up your cross. You followed him. And at the end of that finish line, right, it was Jesus, right? And, and you kept going. Even though we were uh, I pictured myself at the end of the line that I would have two feet and I'd be running through there, right? But uh, it appears I'm going to be limping and <laughs> crawling. I'm coming, Lord! <laughs> it's going to get hard. I get it. Um, but, but it's because of Christ Jesus. He's worthy and he's imputed his righteousness to you and I that now you and I are allowed in, uh, which is amazing. So, in fact, Hebrews 4.15 it says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the only reason that we can approach him uh, is because he is He's worthy. And we can't come because of our worthiness. We can only come because of his bloodshed for us there upon the cross, right? And it's because of his finished work, I should say, um, there upon the cross and, and dying for us. So uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, which we did, right? If you're the body of Christ, if you're the church, you confessed your sins, you humbled yourself, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All that filth, all that sin that you've entered into, guess what? The slate is clean. Think about that. Isn't that amazing? In 15 billion years from now, love keeps no record of wrong. God, God is love, First John 4, right? So God isn't going to say, hey, you remember that time you sinned against me? <laughs> right? It, no, we'd probably do that to one another, right? Hey, you remember what you did to me? <laughs> we hold, right, that sin and that record of wrong. God doesn't hold that record against us. It's gone. It's thrown in the sea of forgetfulness, right? Psalm, what is it, 103, uh, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. We're free in Christ Jesus. Uh, in fact, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He was without sin, spotless. He's that lamb of God. Uh, the, the, the Jews would understand this terminology, right? The blood uh, that was to, applied during, you know, that what we call Passover. Um, we're, death passed over us. We're free in him. We're al now alive in him. We're transformed because of him. He is the word of God, right? John 1, 14. Uh, it's Jesus. <laughs> it, I just, I love the Lord. So I, I picture, guys, I mean, think about it. How are you going to enter in when, let's say right now, 
uh, lightning just strikes this place and we all die, right? We all enter in before the Lord. What are you going to do? Some, I picture, might just fall at his feet. That's why I picture myself, uh, you know, I talk about unworthiness, right? I'm going to just, uh, there's, I'm speechless. I have nothing to say to the Lord. And I'm going to fall down and just my face is going to fall flat on the ground. Uh, some, I don't know, they might sit on his lap, right? And just look up and say, Abba, Father, right? And, and you know, embrace him and hug him. That's like my son Ezra. He's always, he's always just wanting to hug me all the time. Dad, I love you. And it's like, man, this kid just told me he loved me like 30 times today. It's just so cool. Um, I'm kind of like that with the Lord myself, right? It's like, Lord, I just want to say I love you. Just check it in. Um, some might even just leap out, out at him, right? You guys have, I have kids, and it's like they're always wanting to die, and you're always going to save them. My, my kids, when they were young, they would always jump, and I'd be like, they're like, Dad, I'm old, and I'm old, what are you doing? i got to catch them, right? Um, and I, I wonder, how is it going to be when we all enter in? What are we going to do, right? It, it's going to be an amazing time, whatever it is we do. But the, let's get back to our notes, guys. The third thing we want to look at about the sea of glass is it involves two songs two songs here in verses three and four number it says they sing the song of moses the servant of god and the song of the lamb so it, it's like a mixtape they mix these two songs together and and it's a remix if you will <laughs> sorry uh, so the Song of Moses, right, that's in um, uh, Exodus 15, uh, which is interesting because Revelation 15, I don't think it's a coincidence, by the way, when they did the chapters and verses and the stuff, right, when you, it's like, wow, they, everything fits in. If you look at the, the, the chapter 3, verse 16, in all the books of the Bible, there's a common thread of redemption, uh, and all of them. It's like, wow, this is so cool. So uh, Exodus 15, Revelation 15. Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, but um, remember the children of Israel, they were led out of uh, uh, Egyptian slavery, and, and they sang the song of Moses, right, which is really like a song of deliverance, a song of uh, hope. And, 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 but the second song is the song of the Lamb, which in Revelation chapter 5 we already looked at, but remember, nobody was worthy uh, to take or even lose those seven seals. You guys remember that? Um, even they're weeping and like, I mean, who, who's going to open it? And yet it was Jesus who was worthy. He, be, he came over and he was able to open it, right? Because only he was worthy. So um, after that, all of heaven broke out in song. You guys remember there in Revelation 5, um, verses 9 and 10. But so here we have two songs coming together as one song. And, and it compiles both songs with the similar thoughts and similar ideas. So it's interesting because the song of uh, Moses that was sung uh, was there at the Red Sea. And now the song of the Lamb is sung at the Glassy Sea. And I was like, hmm, Red Sea, Glassy Sea, interesting. The song of Moses is song about... Uh, bringing people out of a kingdom, speaking of Egypt. Uh, the Song of the Lamb is about um, uh, bringing people into the kingdom. Ah, interesting. The Song of Moses speaks of, uh, well, victory, obviously, from Egypt, but the Song of the Lamb speaks of victory um, from Babylon. You can remember the Babylonian, the, the system, if you will. And now, Let's just look at this song. It says, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. They, they've been revealed, right? Romans 14 verse 11 um, and Philippians 2 uh, verses 10 and 11 say all they both say basically that everyone will bow a knee and and worship before the Lord everybody there everyone's going to confess now only the believers are going to be those who stay if you will and they're able to, to stand before the God the Lord and 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 uh, sing this song uh, before the Lord, 
And remember, all of us are going to stand before the Lord one day, right? Judgment's coming. And, and uh, the, the question is whether you're going to stay in heaven or not. Because there is a place of hell. Those that chose to reject Jesus are going to be sent there. Uh, but those who chose to receive him, if you will, to allow him to uh, and abide in him, um, we get to live with him forever. It's, it's an amazing, it's going to be an amazing time. So um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say with all that. Let's just keep going. The third and final vision uh, is of, well, the temple of heaven. The temple of heaven in verses 5 through 8. Uh, now there's three things to note about this, vi- this final vision. Notice, number one, where it is at. Where, where is it at? In verse 5, it says, After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony, where is it located? In heaven was open. So notice this temple is in heaven. By the way, I thought the, the word temple is an interesting word. The word naos there in the Greek it, it, uh, it refers to a place in the temple, uh, really referring to, most likely, the Holy of Holies. You guys remember where the Ark of the Covenant is, uh, where the, 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 the high priest would enter in once a year for the atonement of the sins of Israel. Um, but the tabernacle, uh, it speaks of the tent of meeting, which Moses and the children of Israel, you guys remember, they built uh, in the wilderness. They later... later um, and took it, uh, Joshua took it to the promised land. Uh, but this also points to the tabernacle of testimony. Normally it refers, we refer to it as the Ark of the Testimony. Uh, so since inside the Ark had what? The Ten Commandments, the Word of God, we would say. Uh, and, and so all of this points to and speaks of really the place of God, uh, which is in heaven. By the way, a uh, little side note, in... Uh, I think it's um, Hebrews 8, 5, somewhere around there. Um, let's just turn there really quick. I want to just show you guys something really cool. So when Moses, speaking of the Ark of the Covenant, by the way, is in heaven. Some people, if you guys watch videos, and, and they, they, we found the Ark of the Covenant. It's there in Turkey. It's, oh, it's over there. It's under Jerusalem. It's in the temple. It's in, the, right? Um, it's actually in heaven, according to the Bible. But Hebrews, um, uh, let's see, I think it's chapter 8. Um, look at verse 5. It says, in Hebrews 8, verse 5, it says, uh, actually go, yeah, verse 5. Who served the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. And, and, um, and it goes on from there. But so notice, it's almost like Moses built a, a, a prototype, if you will, of things, a pattern of what he saw in heaven, according to there in Hebrew. So, um, interesting. Um, Let's keep going on. Notice, notice who comes out of it uh, in verses 6 and 7. Back to Revelation uh, in verses 6 and 7. So notice who comes out of the temple. Uh, it says here in verse 6, And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues. By the way, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, there's just so much you can study on these eight verses. Did you know uh, the, the, the number seven uh, comes up eight times here in Revelation 15, uh, in these eight verses, comes up eight times, which is amazing. I think when something pops up, uh, you know, continually, it's just interesting to consider uh, the number seven being the number of finality, the number of completion. Uh, and, and speaking of these bold judgments that we're, gonna, we're talking about in the context of God's wrath is going to come to completion. It's going to come to an end. So uh, just interesting. It says, so the seven angels having the seven plagues, Clothed in pure bright linen, interesting because it's like the, um, the high priest back in the day, right? We're clothed in, in, in linen. And having their chests girded with golden bands, then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So one of these four living creatures uh, gives the seven last 
bowls uh, uh, full of the wrath of God, these golden bowls containing God's wrath, uh, to each of the seven angels. Now, uh, assuming these are the same seven angels over the seven churches uh, of Asia Minor, they're in uh, Revelation 2 and 3, uh, we don't know. But if it is, that's interesting. But it's interesting because these four living creatures are four, not just creatures, they're four living creatures. Now, if you're still wondering, you know, are we alone on this planet, right? Is it just us human beings that are very intelligent? Uh, when you read the Bible, it's like a no, duh, no, of course you're not the only ones. There's other living, there's other creatures. And these angels are cherubim. They're the, or cherub, cherub being single, cherubim, meaning more than one. Uh, there's the cherubim, the seraphim. There, there's these creatures. I mean, they got uh, six wings, right? The, the two to fly, the two to cover their face, the two down there. And the, they, they got eyes all around. And Ezekiel talking about a will within a will. They travel, the, the, the heart, the soul, if you will, is within the will. And they go together. They, they're like lightning strikes, like boom, 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 boom. And they're, the, these four living creatures are four not dead creatures, but they're living creatures. It just, it just makes, the more you look into it, it's like, wow. <laughs> There's so much, guys, when we get to heaven uh, that we're going to find out. And I, I think my jaw is going to constantly be down and just being in awe of God, right? Like, wow, Lord, wow. Um, anyways, um, let's come to the third and last thing here. Notice, notice what is in it? What, what is in it? It's, it's smoke. We're going to see that it's smoke in verse 8. It says, the temple was filled with smoke, thus the term holy smokes, right? <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dad joke. No. <laughs> so the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till, seven, till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So this smoke represents the glory of and the power of God. But, but I also think it represents the wrath of God because obviously our context is talking about the wrath of God. But nobody was able to enter the temple until these seven last bold judgments, if you will, were poured out on this God-rejecting world. And so uh, these seven bowls are very important. By the way, we're going to go through it. Um, we're going to start these bowls. Uh, judgments in chapter 16 and 17 um, and and talk about them so let's pray guys I'm sorry I miss I miss you guys I miss teaching too so uh, let's let's pray Lord thank you so much for this time uh, that you've given us word says Lord be like the Bereans and not test uh, what Paul's heart was like but rather test Paul's doctrine Lord and and test uh, whether it it lines up with scripture in the context of things. And so just help us, Lord, to, to keep our eyes on you. Uh, keep us, Lord, from deception. We know that that's one of the signs uh, in the end days, Lord, especially there during the wrath uh, that is here on earth, that the Antichrist will be deceiving many. And uh, help us, Lord, not to be under that great delusion, uh, but to be in the truth, Lord. We want to be in you, we want to be set free and, and free, uh, living free before you. And so uh, we love you, Lord. We thank you that we're able to go through this book. And uh, we pray you would continue, Lord, to, to train us uh, and equip us, Lord, by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you guys got any questions, uh, feel free to come on up.